Hello, Internet. Welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us. On today's episode of the DNA Sports Recap, we're going to touch base on the University of Colorado leaving the Pac-12. We're also going to look at the Utah Jazz, make some early season predictions. As well as covering the winners and losers of the MLB trade deadline. We also got UFC 291. All that and more. My name is Darren. That is AJ. And this is the DNA Sports Recap. Roll the intro. part of the 95 percent of our audience that is not subscribed please consider doing so thank you how's it going aj doing good man doing really good how are you awesome doing well how about a little bit pre-show cheers here oh yes that's exactly what i need cheers to you cheers to you ah, good old monkey shoulder man hashtag not sponsor seriously <laughs> if anyone's going to sponsor us it needs to be monkey shoulder it definitely does need to be. yeah yeah um but once again folks thanks again for joining us before we get into content i'd like to take a second to say to all of our listeners and viewers we really appreciate the effort uh, that you folks have put into watching our content lately and we actually have a surprise for you folks there we are having a giveaway we have decided here at the dna sports recap that we are going to be giving away our first 500 dollars that we earned in adsense revenue from youtube business daddy we're going to give it back to our subscribers. Absolutely. So once we get subscribed, once this channel gets monetized, we're going to give the first $500 that we earn back to the subscribers. Five subscribers are going to each earn $100 each. So make sure you go ahead and subscribe to the channel, like this video, and share with your friends there. That way, as soon as we get to the sooner we get to that monetization, the sooner we can get sooner we can give that away. Yep, I love it. All right, so let's go ahead and jump right into it. Let's go ahead and talk about. Uh, let's dive into a little bit of college football today my favorite time of year man i know it's getting close it's getting close yeah it is it's but it's like just far enough away that i'm like ready for it to just happen already yeah it's like for me it's like week four of spring training yeah you're like okay guys this is enough let's just i, I don't need to see you know a and b fields going and you know who's playing on the backfield let's just let's just get the season started already yep um well literally right after we finished wrapped up recording last week uh it was announced by the university of colorado uh their board of regents have voted unanimously to approve the resolve to join the big 12. why is that i mean obviously they think that you know the pac-12 is not going to be the direction for them to move forward um i don't know man i i think this is a, cr a crazy move for colorado um, you know, a lot of this stuff has to do with all of the, um, you know, the TV deals and all these big gigantic TV deals that are happening all over the place. The PAC 12 has not solved their, their media situation quite yet. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, whatever happens in the next coming couple of days is really probably what's going to tell whether Arizona, Arizona state and Utah will end up sticking around. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, simple, simply put, follow the money, uh, university, uh, has been promised an equal share um, of the revenue split from the Big 12, which is not normal. Typically, they usually get anywhere from half to half to three quarters for several years before they get a forced share. But the University of Colorado is getting 32 million an, an annual 32 million uh, from the Big 12. Uh, with the Pac-12 media still not uh, still have not renewed their contract, with expires when it expires June 30th of next year. You know, obviously. I mean, follow the money, man. They're they're jumping because one has a guaranteed thirty-two million. They don't know what they're going to be getting uh, from the Pac-12, especially with the two Southern California schools leaving. You know, it kind of puts them in a yeah. sticky spot. Real sticky. Yeah. Let's go ahead and talk about the Pac-12 a little bit. There, uh, it was uh, uh, Pac-12 Commissioner uh, George Kilikoff. I can never say his name. Kilikoff. Kilikoff. Twists me up every time. <laughs> George Kilikoff. Um, did present the um, media potential media deal with the conference leaders this Tuesday. So last Tuesday, um, another meeting is scheduled uh, to be planned soon to basically get both sides to reach a deal on what uh, was presented to uh, the commissioner there. Uh, word is that is actually from Apple streaming as well as the CW has also been rumored as a potential suitor. So here's my thought. What happens if Colorado joins the big 12 right and apple the richest company in the world comes back and offers 
35, 36 million dollars per school. What do you think that do you think that saves the Pac-12? Well, my opinion is I don't I don't think the Pac-12 is in huge danger of breaking apart anyway. I mean, just because we're down to nine teams, there's definitely some up and coming teams that are going to be looking to join the Pac-12. Um, the big concern is, is Arizona, Arizona State and Utah all sticking around because it's kind of rumored that those three teams are moving together, right, as a package deal. But I mean, it's not like the the Pac-9 as it even sits right now is lacking any talent. You've right. still got Oregon, you've still got Oregon State, Washington, Utah, the defending, you know, two-time conference champions. So right. there's still plenty of talent. They're not going to have any issues getting some teams to join into this conference um, yeah. in, into the future. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, even if you could get in like a Boise State who's on the brink of Power 5 for years, Yeah, right? I, Boise State, a San Diego State who, again, brink of Power 5 for the last couple of years. See, San Diego State did announce earlier this year that they were going to commit to the Pac-12. They have since pulled that back to stay with the Mountain West because of the uncertainty of the Pac-12 media deal. Right. So that's and, not a good look. Well, I know. But, but we know that the Pac-12 has to figure their media rights out before they get anybody to sign with the conference. Yeah. You know? Teams can flip flop all the time. I just, I think there's, there's a lot of options, you know, SMU is kind of rumored to be looking for another conference. So I don't, I don't think the PAC 12 is really threatened of being taken apart. It's more like, can we make sure that it's worth it for all these teams to, to stay in here and keep pushing forward? Yeah. The rumor is if they lose one of the four corner schools, the conference is dead. Uh, Arizona has been rumored to be uh, courted by the big 12 as well as uh, Oregon and Washington have been linked to the big 10 for several off seasons now. Uh, so both schools have been both all three of those schools have been courted by other divisions. It was actually on record on interview that the Big 12 was asking why they didn't say anything about Utah about adding potential teams and said, well, simply they just won't answer our phone call. So apparently Utah is all in on staying with the Pac-12 and isn't even taking calls from other series. Do you think that's a mistake on their part? Um, I think Utah is all about loyalty. Um I think they they kind of know that as long as they stick together through this, you know, and I don't know. I Utah's not going to if the pack, if something happened to the Pac-12, Utah's not going to have any issues finding a conference to go to. There's going to be plenty of options, and you know, I think it's probably them just keeping their options open. You know, I mean, why go talk to the Big Ten or the Big Twelve when you know either one of those and look for offers when you know you you could have a a flurry of offers. I think instantly if anything does happen, so. I did a that lot of my opinion. I did a lot of research on the Pac-12's history over the last, you know, ten years. Uh -huh. Did you know that there was a chance for Utah to add Texas Tech, Texas, really, and and TCU, all to the Pac-12 before before this mix before they ended up leaving? And you know, there, there was this there was this whole. I'll have to share the article with you, and it's fascinating stuff about how much the previous uh, you know Pac-12 commissioner really screwed things up. And didn't really focus on it but there was a chance that they could have expanded there's also a chance that they could have added texas before they committed uh to uh was it sec well they're big 12 now but it's sec now yeah, yeah. they're so, or they're heading to the sec next year so they actually had a chance to to get texas tech in the pac-12 before wait texas or texas tech texas Okay. Not Texas Tech, Texas. Texas, okay. Yeah, I'll have to share the article with you, but it was fascinating. And the only reason why it didn't happen is because we had a new guy uh, in the role, and uh, he was just trying to buddy up with the Southern California schools to get a good idea, try to bring them, keep them in. Yeah. And, uh, we missed a golden opportunity to add a Texas school. I'm like, oh, dude, that's so fascinating. Anyway, this stuff is entertaining as, as all get out, though. I'll have, to, I'll have to say that. There hasn't been this much intrigue, I think, in Pac-12 football off season with every with the conference realignment, not just within you, not just within Pac-12, but all the college football, all the conference realigning and stuff like that's been going on in quite a long time. See, so that's kind of some of my thought on all this. Is when was the last time you saw the Pac-12 in this much of the news? That's a very good point. That's a very. You tell me, there's not some strategy to this. Yeah, like the Pac-12 is the the least talked about conference in all of college football. Mm -hmm. for, for what reason? I don't know. They're one of the most talented. And I mean, it's not just my opinion. Like, watch any of these teams play. It's East Coast bias, man. It, it absolutely everybody's, everybody's is. Everybody's asleep I mean, before it's, anybody it's over here plays. It's 100%. It's East Coast bias, dude. So, and, you know, like Paul Feinbaum was just on uh, ESPN this morning saying, the Pac-12's done, blah, blah, blah. Paul Feinbaum is an idiot. <laughs> He's the biggest SEC rooter. All he, all he does is, like, 
I can't even say the things that he does to Alabama and all these SEC teams. Mm-hmm. It's ridiculous, dude. I just, I don't know. I hate, I hate, really hate that dude. But, <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I That's what I think is going to happen. I think uh, they have an awesome offer that comes back from Apple. It's actually going to dwarf what the what the Big 12 are getting per school. And I think it's going to be a larger share because there's less teams to give it to. And then you're going to see teams like San Diego State wanting to come back in the fold. Boise State willing to move to the conference. I st- I, that's what I see happening. I see the conference expanding after they get the number from Apple TV because – Apple TV is the Apple is the largest company in the world. They are worth like four trillion dollars. Yeah, they're if they wanted to get in the college football game, they're going to throw some money at it. You know, I mean, they did a great job with baseball, and not to mention they're they're headquartered in California. Yeah, so like if there's going to be a conference that Apple's going to pay to get into, it's going to be the Pac-12. Yeah. So I don't know. I think uh, I think the future is bright there, but it's really up to uh, the Pac-12 commissioner to not screw it up. A lot of people gave him flack for not announcing a TV deal during Pac-12 Media Day. He said he all wanted it to be all about football and everything like that, and not during. But you know, they said there's a lot of people who aren't happy with him. So we'll see how that shakes out. Do you really think that Deion Sanders missed because of surgery, or did he just conveniently have surgery recovery because he didn't want to be because he knew the conference was moving? I think it was probably surgery. I, I just don't see Deion Sanders missing any opportunity to be in front of any camera. That's true. So it was it was probably a legit surgery because okay. if, if he would have had a chance to be in front of a camera and telling everybody how awesome he is because he's Deion Sanders. He's, he's going to take it. Yeah, yeah he's definitely going to take it. it. Yeah. I just uh, tend to err on the side of conspiracy whenever I can in sports. Of course. You know. <laughs> Why not? It's funner. All right. Let's go ahead and move shift over to uh, the NBA, a little bit of the Utah Jazz basketball. Now, one thing that I do want to get involved, uh, talk about real quickly with Utah before we jump into the Utah Jazz uh, is actually a former Utah Jazz player. Uh, Doak signs a two-year, sorry, a two-way contract with the Phoenix Suns. So hopefully uh, Doak gets some uh, gets some playing time. This doesn't really days. surprise me. Yeah, Doak, I mean, he was on the tail end of the roster for the Jazz. Um, he's not a super efficient scorer. He's more of a, a Rudy Gobert type catch and dunk the basketball on follow-up plays. He can't create his own shot. He's pretty good defensively. I wish Doak all the best. I, I mean, he he had some he had some fun highlights, and uh, I, I think he had some real potential to be a Rudy Gobert type player. Mm-hmm. But I just you don't need two Rudy Gobert type players on your team ever. No, no. So and especially with you know the injury history that the Phoenix Suns have and the players the the roster they have. Yeah. Who knows? He actually may get a lot more playing time than we we're expecting. So, yeah. Uh, good luck to Doak. Hopefully, he does does the most of his time there, and. Uh, you know, it all works out for them. Let's go ahead and talk about ESPN. ESPN released their uh, early season, early preseason record for what the Utah Jazz are going to be. Now, currently, both them and SB Nation have the Utah Jazz ranked as 22nd in the power rankings, which actually is not that bad. That means that there's eight other teams that the Jazz are better than in the power rankings, yeah. which I think is awesome. Uh, but they do show ESPN does have them at a 37 and 45 missing the playoffs. Uh, SB Nation, ha- sorry, DraftKings has them at a 35.5 win total. Are you taking the over or the under on that? One? Oh, I'm taking the over all day, brother. <laughs> I'm taking the over all day. All right. I, I like it. I'm actually confused on how anybody thinks this team doesn't go 500. I'm curious as why people think this team's going to be worse than it was last year. Like, like, at, like, literally think it's going to be worse than last year. Didn't they have 37 wins last year? They had 37 last year, yeah. So why does anybody think they're not, it's going to be exactly the same? They got better. The Jazz got better in this offseason. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. I would argue the Jazz won the offseason <laughs> with the moves uh, they made. Like, the it's draft pretty, was it's, insane. It's almost obvious. They got John Collins. Yeah. You know, you got uh You Kessler re-signed Jordan Clarkson. And extended him. Yeah. You know. Uh, Kessler is going to play for Team USA basketball, which is only going to give him more experience, yep. you know, and giving him a better exposure. So when he comes back, he's going to have a look even more, it's going to be even further developed. You keep a very talented Colin Sexton still playing for the team. You draft Keontae George, who is a superstar in summer league. And not that that means anything, but you've got a ton of potential there. Yeah. You re sign Talon Horton Tucker mm-hmm. or, ex- or extend him. I mean, you've still got Ochai Baji on the team. You've got you draft Taylor Hendricks. Like, there is so many good players on this team. Yeah, I don't understand it at all. It makes no sense to me why anybody 
and like the only thing that I can think is like, oh, they're you know they're all still kind of like a younger group, and maybe they don't, maybe they maybe they have trouble gelling or. or most of this team was together last year. <laughs> Maybe they don't have that chip on their shoulder they had last year. I, I disagree, though. Yeah. I mean, I, I think... Well, well this, they, obviously. It, I was going to say, if they didn't have it, they do now. Yeah, so thank you. Yeah, ESPN. exactly. Thanks, ESPN. Appreciate great that. work. Because now our dad's going to come out and kill it. Yeah. So. And uh, let's go ahead and back that up with uh, the next thing. SB Nation actually has uh, Kessler as an early front runner for Defensive Player of the Year. I think that's fantastic. Well, Well-deserved. I think the fact that he was, you know, in the top three already at the end of last season makes it a kind of a duh thing to put him as a potential for this year but sport sb nation to put him as the front runner for defensive player of the year next year yeah that's pretty cool that's speaks highly of him pretty impressive i i think that he will struggle to be as effectively defensively this year i obviously i really like walker but teams now know that he's not just some young dumb kid in the paint he's quick enough that he can make a move get to the basket behind you I'm actually I'm super excited to see him playing with Taylor Hendricks, yeah. who's who's a good weak side defender that can come over and make blocks. And so, I mean, I think it's going to help his case um, as a great defender, you know, like as you know, players within five feet of him or whatever making in their shot efficiency. But I think once you're once you're known as, as a premier shot blocker and you can move and, and get to the basket and I, I think he'll have a little more trouble being yeah. as effective. I I could see your point there, but I'm actually going to disagree with you on that one. I think this Jazz team is better suited to spread the floor defensively than ever before. Yeah, I think it, he's got a better chance to go help the helper or be helped than any Jazz team we've had in the last decade. They have more length. They have more defensive-minded players and a defensive-minded head coach in in Hardy that, that, that I don't think they've had in a long time. And I think this ex- additional ex- help that he's going to get from being on Team USA Basketball for the World uh, World Cup or World whatever they do, World Basket. Sorry. FIBA. FIBA. <laughs> whatever. Um, <laughs> it's only going to give him, you know, again, I think, I think his talent, like he already was more efficient as a big man in the league than Rudy Gobert was last year. And he was already more efficient as a big man than Rudy Gobert at the same age in this league. I think he has a higher ceiling than Rudy Gobert did. I agree. I, I think the issue, though, is when you're looking at a Rudy Gobert with the Utah Jazz three, four years ago, you're looking at a team that had turnstiles for defensive players on every spot except for Rudy. Their whole defensive scheme was literally feed every player into Rudy into the mid range and into the like under the basket. Mm-hmm. Rudy didn't have any choice but to be ridiculously efficient at what he was doing. I I think that with the better defensive players that we have on the team this year and with a little bit more length, I think that's why his efficiency won't shine as much because you've actually got decent perimeter defenders. Okay, so you're playing saying, perimeter defense. Yeah. You're saying that the, the number of blocks he's going to get and everything like that's going to go down. Exactly. Like Just because Simply. we have better defenders on the team now. Yeah. Well, I I was I would assume that his his WAR will go up. I agree. Yeah. Um, I also would like to point out that he is. There's only one other player, sophomore player, uh, in the NBA last year that wasn't required to report to summer league, and that was the rookie of the year, other than Kessler. Really? In the entire NBA. So that's how high Paolo Banchero was the only other one, huh? That's how highly the Jazz think of him. Wow. And I do not think that they are wrong. There's a reason why he was one of the only chips between him. Not to mention he's such a cool dude. Just watch any interview with Walker Kessler and you'll just love the guy. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. I'm getting excited for some Jazz basketball, man. They're doing a whole bunch of promo shoots with the rookies. Yeah. It's going to be great. It's going to be a very long time between now and October. I'll tell you that way. Utes, come out the door swinging so we have someone to cover, please. Yes. That'd be Um, fantastic. Dude, yeah. I was looking. I'm just telling you, I was looking at getting a half season of jazz tickets again. Heck yeah, dude. That'd be awesome. I might. I got to figure it out, but I might do it. Yeah. Yeah. Like and subscribe. You yeah. <laughs> that, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> yep. Um, who knows? We might even give away tickets. Uh, uh, that'd, be, our, that'd be a ticket. Viewers. I mean, we could probably work something out like that if you guys can hit that like, subscribe button. That's right. Share wherever it is. Yep. It's be here somewhere. Either right there <laughs> or right there. Um, and we the don't subscribe know. button's right down there so um yeah anyway so you got i think it's fantastic i think it's funny that the jazz aren't uh being shown you know the proper respect i think they deserve with the, how well they did the off season every year i don't see how they don't make the playoffs like, I, agree. I, I believe they're either seventh and eighth seed uh, they may even shock me and not even have to be in the playing tournament i just i know the west is stacked but i think the jazz won the off season and they're gonna be in the playoffs this year 
I 100% agree. All right. Yeah. So far, we're agreeing, and this is not making for great uh, well, I just, and content. I, I just... <laughs> I mean, we did, at least we disagreed on Walker Kessler. That's true. Yeah, that's true. We did. We Keep didn't watching. disagree. Keep watching. We yeah, agree, we might fight about more. We agree and disagree on things. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I I just, it's not just because I'm a Jazz fan, dude. It's because I actually think they're a really talented basketball team. I just, I just don't see how they're overlooking a man. It drives me nuts. Anyway, um, you got anything else on the Utah Jazz? That's or it. Anything man. else on the NBA? That's it, man. All right, let's go ahead and move on, and let's go ahead and talk a little bit about uh, Major League Baseball and the trade deadline. Um, so where would you like to go first with this? Well, I mean, the, the biggest, the biggest trade that I saw that happened was Justin Verlander, right? And that was the okay. trade of the whole off season. Yeah. Justin Verlander, uh, was traded to the Houston Astros. Um, I believe the Dodgers were in on it as well as the Giants and a few other teams were also trying to get his service. Uh, but from the most, from the most part, from what I've read, uh, it was pretty much Houston was the only place he really wanted to go. But he had a, he had a trade. Uh, he had a trade kicker in his contract, right? Where he could deny a trade. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No trade clause. Okay, so, okay. So he had a clause in his. Just like Max, Max Scherzer, uh, who went to the Texas Rangers. Okay. Um, yeah, Verlander ended up with uh, Houston, and yeah, and they just <laughs> they just had a pitcher throw a no hitter yesterday. I saw. That. So you know. You got Justin Verlander, who was a Cy Young Award winner for 2022, has an ERA of 1.49 over the, over the last month, over his last five starts. Yeah, things. If you're a Houston Astros fan, things are looking good for you. So, Ooh. yeah, yeah. Well. Yeah. Okay, so my question is, which trade that happened is the most impactful moving forward? Uh, the most impactful. I'm gonna go with the Lucas Giolito to the Angels trade. Oh, really? Yeah. That's Why do you think so? Going. Uh, I think it was the move they needed to make in order to keep uh, Shohei Otani happy. Okay. I think that's going to have a ripple effect. I think, just like we talked about in our previous video, where you and I both agreed. Check that out. That's right. Where Shohei Otani was not going to get traded at the deadline. Uh, we both agreed that it was a stupid move for them to do. But, you know, they don't want to be known as the guys who traded away Shohei Otani. So uh, they knew they could have gotten uh, King's ransom for him. But they decided to go the other way, push all their chips in the middle, try and make the playoffs. Which and, I love. Yeah, which they yeah. don't, there are no guarantees there. They are four games yeah. out the final wild card spot. And you got teams like Texas uh, and Houston battling for the division. Whoever's going to not win that is going to get the first wild card spot. So then you got two wild card spots that you have left. And then now you have to deal with the Rays because uh, they lost their spot to the Orioles. So you have the Baltimore Orioles or the Rays that you're going to have to deal with uh, for the other spot. And then you also have all the other teams, like you got uh, potentially the Yankees. They can turn around and get hot. Uh, you've got the Boston Red Sox that are in there. You have uh, several other American League. I mean, teams. you got to plan on somebody making a push at some point. Yeah. So and then so you literally have one spot, and you're four games out right now. But yeah, I think the Lucas Giolito trade uh, was it, man. Um, they also brought back uh, CJ Crone, um, Randall uh, Gerchuk, Mike Mustakis, and Eduardo Escobar. So, yeah, the Angels were a big time winner this offseason. I'm sorry, this trade deadline. And that only and the only reason because I think it did enough if they even get to the playoffs, they did enough to show Shohei Otani, hey, stay in Anaheim. I think yeah. it's, give me the biggest one. Dude, How that's you? crazy. Wait, do you, so, what do you think? No, I agree. Okay. Yeah. No, I mean I I think they made just enough moves. Um obviously keeping Otani is the end goal here. Right. You know, but but if they don't if they don't make it to the playoffs, I think it's all over. Right. So so did they push enough chips in? That's obviously yet to see. But you know, Otani's the most talented man in baseball. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it does he he's gonna be just fine no matter where he ends up. It's you know, do the Angels have enough to to keep him around? Yeah. I think they, they know that that literally his just his salary his salary will be covered by jersey sales and ticket sales alone. Yeah. Like that's gonna be a wash. Whoever gets Otani, they're not gonna be losing money because he's gonna sell tickets, he's gonna sell jerseys. Uh but the fact that Lucas Giolito, Ronaldo Lopez, both of those guys are um starting pitcher in a bullpen. That fixes their two biggest holes they've had this off se this season so far. Uh CJ Crone and Rendell Gerchik, they were both originally drafted by the Angels and were traded back. And Mike Mustak is just a powerful bat to swing for the fences. And Eduardo Escobar, both of these fill the holes of uh, people like um, Anthony Rendon and Mike Trout who are out on injury. So right. I really think they made a huge push for it. Whether it's enough, we'll see. Yeah. But, yeah. What was your favorite move your Dodgers made? 
This is a very sore subject for me. <laughs> I believe my daughters did jack squat in order to improve this offseason. So, Andrew Friedman, you have lost the title of In Friedman We Trust. I'm sorry. Now it's In Friedman I Question. Because what the hell, man? Like, seriously. Um, so, I don't know if you heard the whole drama behind the whole... Um, I did not. Erod, Eduardo Rodriguez. So, the Dodgers work with the Detroit Tigers to trade uh, Eduardo Rodriguez to the Dodgers, right? We don't know what they're going to be traded back. We don't know what prospects they gave it, but Detroit was happy. Like, yeah, let's do it. Okay, great. That works. Trade was in place. They didn't go, hey, Eduardo, we're uh, we're going to be great news. We're going to be trading you to the Dodgers so you can compete and, you know, get the bag this offseason because you're going to play some meaningful minutes in the playoffs and meaningful innings. And yeah, you're going to need this. You're going to need this to yeah. really. And he says, I don't want to go. Sorry. I'm blocking the trade. He blocks the trade. He, he obviously has yeah, no, yeah, no trade clause, so well. he blocks okay. the trade. So I feel like these are more common in the MLB than they are the NBA. Uh, yeah, they're definitely a more okay. big of a bargaining chip. Um, instead of have league, instead of instead of player empowerment, where you let the players basically control the league, you let them decide where they get to want to be traded. Um, you Fair know. enough. Boo on two people. One, Andrew Friedman. You didn't do any back. You didn't do any research to make sure he wasn't going to say no to the trade. Detroit, you didn't make sure that he no was okay with being traded. Phone calls. <laughs> you knew he had a no trade clause in his contract. Why are you not? Why is nobody talking to the pitcher before they trade him? You know, and and to the pitcher, you're an idiot, Erod. I know you probably are staying for personal reasons, and yes, you want to be close to your family. I'm never going to, you know, never going to say that's a bad thing. You should always put your family first. But it's two months, man. You literally sidestepped eighty million dollars by doing this. By staying on a lonely on a on a team that's destined to you know not make the playoffs, you know you are an all star caliber. Yourself, yeah, just hurting yourself. You pitch meaningful postseason innings with the Dodgers, and someone's going to give you the bag. You know, you literally just flushed eighty million dollars down the toilet by just not accepting this trade because you wouldn't. It's just money. It's just a couple of months, man. Like. Yeah. Extended vacation. I'm pretty sure the Dodgers would put your family up in somewhere in LA and you would have been fine. Guaranteed. So, yeah. Um, no, I'm not happy with that. I would say my favorite so far has definitely been the Kike Hernandez trade. Bringing back Kike. He did have an interview after the win yesterday where he had a few key plays on both the infield and the outfield, saving some uh, some multi-baggers. He also broke the game open with a bases clearing double. And, you know, just... He just got up in front of the the post game interview. He goes, I you I did not realize how much I needed this and how much I needed to be back here. He's like, and even this is the end of it. If this is the end of the ride, then so be it. I'm going to enjoy every minute of it. So thank you, Dodgers fans. Thank you, Dodgers, for bringing me back. Dude, I'm that's like, actually awesome. Heck yeah, get it, Kike. Yep, we're cheering for you here at the DNA Sports Recap. Hell yeah, hell yeah, banana suit and all, man, go for it. Um, did you see the video that we posted about the Kike Hernandez trade? I mean, when we talked about the trade deadline so far. And I, I saw the video. I don't when recall the Kike when, part. Yeah. Oh, the video, like the clip you cut into for Kike? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's what it's about. When he yeah. came into the dugout, beginning of the game for the first game, he was like, hey, hey, hey. He yeah. just starts dancing. <laughs> it's just like, dude, that's Kike, man. Kike, Absolutely Kike. love that. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, winners in the MLB trade deadline. You got any other questions for me? No, that's okay. it. Okay. Okay. That's it. Uh, winners in the uh, MLB trade deadline, obviously, the Texas Rangers, they had uh, Mad Max and Jordan Montgomery, the other right handed pitcher that. That every team that needed started pitching was coveting, including my Dodgers. So the Rangers added two great starting pitchers, Anaheim Angels. An Anaheim Angels, we already talked about them. Uh, Miami Marlins, they got Dave Robertson, the Mets closer. Josh Bell, a switch hitter, they got from Cleveland. They added Jake Berger. They are currently a wild card team. Gotcha. So the Florida Marlins are pushing their chips in the middle. They have a wild card spot right now. And they're not letting go. So good for them. They're making a push for it. So good job, Miami. Uh, honorable mentions are Houston Astros. Obviously, they're making a push with uh, Verlander and uh, Kendall Graveman. Uh, the Mets also traded away all their pitchers uh, to get... Uh, the Mets just cleaned house. <laughs> and the worst part is, is that uh, Cohen is actually paying the majority of these contracts. Like he's... Like Max Scherzer's deal, he's only... They're only like... The Rangers are only paying twenty five million of that contract. That's insane, dude. Yeah, he's making like forty like that's, million a that's year. That's a deal. That's a, they, they literally stole him from the Mets. Yeah, yeah. But here's the thing: is that the Mets got to choose their prospects. So they got high level prospects gotcha. at both of these, both uh, out of uh, Houston and Texas. Uh, so, which is so they funny. got some good guys. They got some really good guys by doing gotcha. this. So I give them an honorable mention for winning the playoff tread deadline because 
uh, sorry, the MLB trade deadline because of the fact that they did so well in making sure the talent they got back was worth it. So good job on them for doing that. And this is going to be interesting. We now have a Texas showdown for the AL East. Sorry, for the AL West. You got the Houston Astros and the Texas Rangers both vibing for first place in the division. Whoever doesn't win gets an all-star, does get a wild card. So imagine the uh, Texas Rangers and the uh, Houston Astros going head-to-head, both aces, former teammates from earlier in the season. With the that's Mets. actually pretty cool. That's going to be fun to watch. Yeah, so, that is pretty cool. Yeah. So let's go ahead and pivot to the losers of MLB. So let's go ahead and talk about first the New York Yankees. They basically traded away for a starting pitcher with a 10 ERA and for cast considerations. So not great Yankees. You really didn't do much. Um, and they are actually three games out of a wild card spot as at the time of recording. Uh, the Baltimore Orioles, they are first place in their division. They had the best record in the American League. And what did they do? They added Jack Flaherty, Logan Reinhardt, uh, Shintaro Fujisim- uh, Fuji- Fujinami. I can't believe I had a hard time saying that. <laughs> um, but yeah, they're currently holding first place and they may have it for the rest of the season, but you didn't do anything to really improve your team. I mean, Jack Flaherty is a great pitcher, but he's just an okay pitcher. That's what you already have. Is a bunch of okay guys, right? Yeah, they're right now they're leaning on two of the best bullpen arms in baseball right now, Bautista and Cano. Uh, I don't think adding Flaherty is going to be enough to be an innings eater. You know, they they should have gone out and did more. They should have gone out and got an an E Rod. He wanted to stay on the East Coast. Well, Baltimore Baltimore's yeah, closer Baltimore, to the East Coast. Baltimore needed somebody. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, I just thought that was interesting. But uh, yeah, so those are the winners and the losers of the trade deadline. Um, I got one more thing on baseball. Okay, I'm ready. Um, so good news. Okay. By the way, for you, I love good news, Mr. AJ. So it was originally announced in November of last year. Liberty Media. This is the team that owns the Atlanta Braves. Okay. They are splitting off the Atlanta Braves into a separate company called the Atlanta Braves Holdings Holdings Inc. And it's a publicly traded company. So what that means is anyone can buy shares in the team, and they are the first team in Major League Baseball to do this. I can be a partial owner of the Braves. You can be a partial owner of the Braves. Dude, this is what I'm talking about. Uh, it was, I've been waiting for this opportunity my whole life. It's not just the ownership of the team. It's also ownership in the arena and also the battery, which is kind of like the downtown area surrounding the team. Yeah, I'd be like, I run this place walking yeah. in. So, yeah, currently uh, at the time of recording, price per share is $46 per share. That's not bad. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. What do you? What's your I take? Be a partial owner, man. Yeah. So, what do you think? Do you think? Uh, you think it's worth investing into the uh, Atlanta Braves? You know, best record in baseball, all that good stuff. I mean, I think it's a pretty cool business model. I mean, to have to have this kind of business model and also be one of the best teams in Major League Baseball, I think, is kind of setting the bar a little high for some other teams to try to do that. Yeah. Um, but I mean, the Braves have been good for a while, so yeah. Um, I think I think it's a smart move. I like it. I think it. Uh, I think it's going to help get the get probably more people kind of involved in the, in yeah. You know I mean, like even just for that thought, like, well, I own one share of this. Yeah, you know? it comes in like a little certificate and everything. Yeah, that's it's super great. cool. I like it. Yeah. Uh, rumor has it that uh, this was originally done as a way to separate. Uh, this is the same company that owns uh, Live Nation, so and the concert companies. Yeah. And some other different things. So if they wanted to sell the team. Having it be in the same company as right. Liberty doesn't, Media doesn't actually work. It won't work. So yeah. they position it this way and put it this way so they could be. It'd be easier to sell the team if they wanted to. Um, uh, but as it sits, sits right now, there is no plans, no immediate plans to sell the team at all. So this is something they're gonna be rolling with for a while. So super cool. I think that's awesome. Go Braves. Yeah. So um, yeah. I mean, everything's gonna stay the same. They're gonna still run the team the way they are. Just it's just very similar. Can you name another franchise that is actually owned by the fans? No. Green Bay Packers. Are they really? Yep. Green Bay Packers. I'm not aware of that. Um, so yeah, anyway. Um, we'll see if this is becomes a trend if other MLB teams do this or if this is just a nice little novelty uh for the Atlanta Braves fans to actually own an ownership. They do sell the team. Um, uh, I wonder if they, you know, each person who has a share gets like a buyout or yeah. something. I want my buyout. Yeah. I bought it at 45. We sold at 53. Here yep. we go. Oh, my eight bucks. Yep. Sold for 2.7 billion. That means I got $60 coming my <laughs> way. Uh, but yeah, fantastic stuff. All right. Let's go ahead and move right along to uh, what happened in USC uh, in uh, SLC over the weekend, which is UFC 291. Yeah. So that was pretty exciting. This Funny, kind of- I got some friends that are like in different spots around the country and they all text me like, hey, are you at UFC tonight? 
I ended up going camping. So the answer was no. Right. But <laughs> kind yeah. of funny that, you know, like we had another major event uh, here in Salt Lake City. Yeah. And I was a little disappointed. This one kind of snuck up on me. I actually wanted to go to this. I thought this would be an interesting experience. Yeah. Because I don't know if you saw any of the highlights from the fights or anything, or if you watched the fights, but they did a good job hosting this fight, like hosting this card, man. It was amazing in there. So, and that was, that was kind of what I saw was like, and I read like multiple articles on just like the environment. And it was that pretty much the Delta center was a great venue for these fights. Yeah. It was insane. Yeah. Especially with all the new additions, you know, the double ring around there and how they were utilizing that color wise and yeah. how, it, how they projected onto the octagon. And it was just, it was, it was amazing to watch. Uh, so some notable things from a UFC 291 is let's start with the uh, women's early prelim fight. Uh, that uh, the showed uh, Miranda uh, Maverick with a submission over Priscilla uh, in the third round, uh, which was actually the only uh, female on the card, uh, female fight on the card, which I thought was kind of odd. There's usually a couple. Yeah, usually a couple. Uh, so I was a little bit concerned there, but that's that's cool. Um, let's go ahead and move on to the main card. That was uh, Dustin Pure. Poirier. Poirier. Sorry, guys. I'm struggling with names today. And uh, Justin Gaethje uh, with a TKO with one minute left in the second round. Now that was... Uh, you see that head kick? Yes, exactly. That's, yeah. I'm like, now that was a knockout, man. <laughs> yeah, so he, he throws, he like fakes a jab with his left hand and then just full on head kicks. And dude, he goes down and then he... Well, yeah, he throws the left and he throws the right, but he goes to guard the right. And he doesn't see, for those of you who are listening on podcasts, I'm putting my yeah. arm up. Uh, he... Guard goes to guard from that one and does not see the foot coming right at him. I don't care if you have like a 10 pound bag on that thing or a medicine ball. He kicks that it, with your hand right there. You're out. You're done. Yeah, it was. It was insane. That was a that was a yeah, that was a pretty crazy kick. So kind of cool, though. Did you see like the sportsmanship between these two guys? Yeah. I mean, you can't beat that, dude. Like, I love it because especially being that it's such a physical, like raw sport for these two guys to like just beat the hell out of each other for every minute that they're in the octagon and then be able to, you know, like dap up and, and yeah. be cool with each other when it's all said and done. And like, it really is just a sport. Like, I don't know. Yeah. I, Justin, I love was, it, dude. Justin was getting his photos taken and doing the photo shoot after. And Dustin actually came out and, you know, was in his street clothes and after he got his treatment and everything. And just walks up and gives him a bump and says, Hey, thanks. Uh, Justin said in the huddle when, uh, at the end of the fight, when they were hugging at the end of the, in, in the octagon, uh, he mentioned, uh, he said, by the way, let's promise each other never to fight each other again. Yeah. <laughs> let's not do this again. <laughs> uh, but Justin did say if he ever did ask him cause he needed it, he would do another one because Dustin did let Justin have a rematch too. So gotcha. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. That's super you know, cool. This was, you know, Justin, uh, sorry, Dustin won the first flight. Justin won the second. So if Dustin needs it for his career advancement, he will do, he'd be more than willing to fight him again, but he, uh, he doesn't want that to be his next. I love that, dude. Yeah. I think that's very cool. Very, very cool. Yeah. Um, so some notable performances of the night. Uh, Derek Lewis had a one round, uh, K uh, first round knockout over Marcus de Lima. Dude, he just went crazy. Yeah. That was right out the gate. Flying just, knee. He's like, I'm gonna come at you like a spider monkey. Yeah. Just a flying knee. Right. That's not what I expected out of that dude. What a big dude, man. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was nuts. And did you see his after fight dance? Yeah. <laughs> Takes his pants off. Yeah. Like, you dude, you're in Utah, man. Yeah. That's illegal in so many you places. You don't have to here. show your garments. Okay. He yeah. just. <laughs> Jeez, these people, man, they have no yeah. idea. This is Utah, man. Family place. <laughs> Own it keep, down. keep the shorts on. Keep it down. You, you, you know what he didn't like? It's the fact that everybody kept calling him pants. It's like, why does everybody keep calling him pants? I was wearing shorts. <laughs> Like that's not the, you're you're burying missing the, lead the point here, here buddy. Yeah, you're missing the you're point. Missing the point. Um, but yeah, also Bobby Green wins via submission uh, in the third round over Tony Ferguson. Um, I thought that was actually an interesting uh, play there uh, for that uh, submission hold there. Um, I did not see that coming. I thought it was going to be. Uh, I thought that one was going to be a knockout. I thought that he had a chance to get a knockout there. But um, anyway, that's all I have on UFC 291. Uh, you got anything else on? No man, it was a it was a night night full of electricity. I'm glad it was here in Salt Lake City for sure. Yeah, we're gonna have to make sure that we get it out on the calendar next time they're in yeah, town because I'd love for us to cover that. Absolutely, um, folks, let us know down in the comments down, down below. In the comments exactly. Abs if you know we, there's something we missed on the USC 291, I'm pretty sure we there is. Uh, there's a lot that happened in that in that fight. We actually skipped a few of the absolutely of the pre card prelim card, but um, yeah, let us know what your takeaway was from USC 291. Um, again, the venue seemed to host very well. And hopefully we, we see more of that going forward. 
Um, you got anything else? Oh, man. It was a good episode. Yeah, that's right. It was. Once again, folks, uh, if you are watching this on YouTube as one of our short videos, the full episode will be available as a podcast. You'll find it underneath our playlist labeled podcasts. Yep. And if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you like it, share it. Make sure you subscribe to it. Again, we're giving that money away. Uh, make sure you subscribe. Send it to people to get them to subscribe to. Absolutely. Our first $500 that we earned in that central revenue will be given back to subscribers. So make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out on the opportunity to do that. Also, if you're listening to this as a podcast, make sure you rate and review. Once again, folks, my name is Darren. That is AJ. This has been the DNA Sports Recap. Till next time. I've got to pee so bad. <laughs>